Dear guests, on behalf of Peppel and Fuchs, I'd like to welcome you to this online summit. Three days, three topics and three different formats about the special portfolio of Peppel and Fuchs, its products and of course use cases and how you, dear guests, might benefit from them. We have keynotes, we have presentations and we have panel discussions with experts to discuss the topics more into detail. My name is Oliver Sequenz and I'm your host for this extraordinary event. Coming together in this way is of course due to the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany and all over the world. Security is one of the central aspects of the Peppel and Fuchs DNA and so we decided to put security on top of this online summit and to produce it all digital. So. Of course, you all have your experience with, uh, for example, WebEx, Skype or Teams. And I guess you can understand why we decided to produce this in advance. So let's start with our first topic. And I'm definitely not exaggerating when I say this is the driver for the industrial revolution, the IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. It offers huge opportunities. I'm pretty sure you heard buzzwords like OPC UA, IO Link or Sensoric 4.0. And today we want to show you special products and of course use cases and how you, dear guests, might benefit from them and that Peppel and Fuchs is a driver for this revolution. So enjoy the keynote from Helge Hornes, Technical Director Americas in Twinsburg, Ohio. Thank you very much, Oliver. IoT is a hot topic being discussed at trade shows, conventions, on internet platforms, and in magazines. In contrast to many other trends in automation, these conversations, though, include nearly every aspect of an organization, including logistics planners, engineers, and financial experts. But why is IoT such a heavily discussed topic? What do the various stakeholders expect to get out of an IoT implementation? Do all parties have a common understanding of the coming changes? At its most fundamental level, the IoT revolution is expected to reduce waste, improve output, and increase productivity. The goal of the Pepper and Fuchs online summit is to give various experts from within Pepper and Fuchs, as well as partners with IoT implementation experience, a platform to share best practices and results. Armed with this new information, we are confident that you can be a driver in the IoT revolution. One of the questions at the center of the IoT conversation relates to technology. Here it is important to recognize that no fundamentally new solutions are required. Many aspects of IoT utilizes internet technologies that have been around for 20 plus years, HTTP and MQTT, for instance. Even more recent advances, let's say OPC OA, can still trace their roots back to concepts from the last century. So why did it take this long to consider IoT? And why are companies still unsure how to implement and benefit from this fourth industrial revolution? Currently, factory automation is undergoing substantial transformations, and IoT is being discussed and evaluated regarding all aspects of manufacturing. Automatic work scheduling, augmented reality work instructions, and results trackings are just a few areas where digitalization has gained substantial traction in all cases, sensors, the eyes and ears of a process, are critical input parameters. Sensors with IO-Link interfaces offer a wealth of diagnostics data and unparalleled configurability. For instance, ultrasonic sensors can be instructed to have narrow or wide beam patterns and provide signal quality feedback. Photoelectric sensors offer automation-relevant digital switching signals while at the same time they perform precise distance to target measurement, thus supporting preventive maintenance functions. Inductive sensors have the ability to provide additional alarm signals, out of range or pre-collision indication, reducing the likelihood of process faults and parts collisions. These principal functions are not new. Analog sensors have always given distance measurement values to PLCs, and signal quality outputs have been offered more than 20 years ago. 
New is the fact that these diverse data now coexist in digitized format are available without additional wiring. Adding the idea of flat IP networks, shedding the limitations of strictly hierarchical structures of the past, and mixing in advances originating in web technology opens countless new productivity enhancing opportunities. Driven by a technology we call multi-link, IO-link data blocks communicating on OPC UA permit non-time critical control without a PLC while still allowing parallel PLC control if necessary later. Sensors can provide data to PLC-driven machine control while simultaneously enable algorithms that predict future maintenance needs. RFID systems, historically thought of as complex, are now easy to use and by virtue of MQTT offer valuable data to any number of concurrent verification and logistics processes. Multilink also enables digital hydraulics and proves that even well understood manufacturing processes, sintering for instance, can be made more effective using parallel data processing. Communication methods like MQTT, OPC UA and REST API, along with industrial real-time technologies, Ethernet IP and Profinet for instance, are at the heart of these advancements. At the end of the day, though, it takes products like our ICE2 and ICE3 IO-Link masters to connect data from the physical world to the digital world, and thus unleashing the benefits of IIoT. Implementing IIoT as part of a greenfield installation is relatively straightforward. But what about brownfield sites that depend heavily on reliable yet arguably inflexible serial devices where the benefits of flat IP communication and data lakes is simply not accessible. What if the PLC that controls the process offers only limited Ethernet connectivity support? Fortunately, device master industrial gateways, products that convert serial to Ethernet and Ethernet to industrial Ethernet protocols, allows the rejuvenation of installation without intolerable financial risks. Similarly, PLCs designed decades ago before modern industrial Ethernet gained a foothold in manufacturing, benefit from IoT solutions. For instance, our latest generation of IO-Link master products support PCCC, allowing certain old PLCs to benefit from IO-Link and its advantages. But how does Pepper and Fuchs fit into the IoT revolution? Pepper and Fuchs is known as a factory automation supplier offering diverse products ranging from the all-important inductive proximity sensor we invented 60 years ago to high-performance RFID and industrial networking components. But the world of Pepper and Fuchs is richer and more diverse than that, offering automation solutions for many markets and customer needs. For instance, VMT, our machine vision technology company, is a perfect example, providing fully integrated turnkey solutions for the global automotive and pharmaceutical space. Customers in these sectors can rest assured that Pepper and Fuchs vision products are applied with peak performance and reliability in mind. While IIoT demands suitable hardware, IOLink sensors, IOLink masters with OPC UA or MQTT interface, RFID products with high performance ethernet connectivity, and device master gateways making information from serial devices available in the cloud, our software experts at Neoception bring the necessary know-how to the table, guaranteeing data integration from the field to the ERP system. But Neoception is more than just a software provider. Their expertise includes the necessary know-how to develop hardware with IoT in mind, cybersecurity aspects included. Our customers frequently have the need for highly specific sensing solutions, addressing the needs and requirements of the markets they're operating in. And addressing those needs, the Pepper & Fuchs customized application team works closely with the customer's engineering department on the one hand and internal experts at Neoception on the other hand. An electronic Kanban system we recently developed is one example where hardware expertise and software knowledge were brought together for maximum benefit. No matter how well a product or solution is being designed, competent technical assistance will be required at some point. 
At Pepo and Fuchs, our CTSS teams offer world-class support on each of the six continents we call home. One of the central goals of IoT is the desire to utilize the intrinsic value of data to a degree simply not possible in the past. Pepo and Fuchs Ecom offers products enabling just that. A maintenance engineer inspecting a piece of machinery in the field will benefit noticeably from machine data live or historic, available instantaneously in electronic format. Ecom ruggedized, intrinsically safe tablets and smartphones bring this power to everyday maintenance operations, no matter how demanding the environment may be. These internal strengths, hardware with IoT in mind, and software solutions that help customers reach their goals, are further enhanced through the cooperation with world-leading software providers like Aviva Group, Software AG, SAP, and PTC. For our customers, the combined expertise of Pepo and Fuchs, Neoception, VMT, Ecom, and those top solution providers translates into faster implementation, higher performance, and full feature utilization. In closing, I would like to thank you for spending your valuable time with us today. Many of the products, technologies, and solutions I mentioned will be discussed in greater detail during the following presentation. Also, please participate in our panel discussion, where you can interact with our experts, ask questions, gain insight into IoT and the world of Pepple and Fuchs, allowing you to drive the IoT revolution in your organization. Thanks again for joining us today, and please enjoy the rest of your day with Pepple and Fuchs. Helga Hornes from Twinsburg, thanks a lot. And I'm sure you want to know more about the IIoT protocols and of course what use cases look like. So let me welcome on stage Lukas Pogoda. Thank you very much, Oliver. I would like to welcome you as well to today's Pebble and Fuchs Online Summit 2020. My name is Lukas Pogoda and I'm a product manager for industrial communication at Pebble and Fuchs. In the next 30 minutes, I want to build up a general knowledge about the IIoT protocols and their specific use cases. This should generate a motivation to give IIoT a try. Let's start with answering the question, what is IIoT about? So far, automation devices like Roboters only provided their data to central PLCs. This PLC was controlling the logic of the application. Today, those automation devices provide additional data like diagnostic or identification data. This data is not necessarily needed at the PLC level to control the application, but it generates a value on a higher level. So we can make this data available in the cloud to decision takers. So IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things, is about collecting data from automation devices and making it available in the cloud so we can generate a value. So IIoT is not about providing customers only with new products. It really generates benefits for them. Those benefits already occur on the field level, where the real processes happen. For example, optical sensors from Pebble and Fuchs today can measure the degree of pollution of the lens. Thus, the lens can be cleaned before it really comes to breakdowns because of fa faulty measurements. Thus, I, as an application engineer, always know the condition of my machinery. With this, I can reduce my maintenance cost. I do not take maintenance actions too early, nor too late. With reducing the downtimes, I can improve the output of my machinery. But IIoT does not only provide advantages on the field level. They also occur on the higher IIoT level. With computer-based data anal analysis, I can look for correlation in parameters which may lead to faulty products. Thus, I can improve the quality of my production. Operators do not necessarily need always to be at the machinery itself. They can be at home, get messages that there are problems with the production, and from home can take actions. And last but not least, IIoT generates complete new business opportunities. For example, pay-per-use models. So let's now start with a technical view on IIoT. We are starting with a comparison between the field level and the higher level IIoT. On the field level, we have the known protocols like Profinet, Ethernet IP, or Ethercut. 
on the IIoT level, there are new protocols like OPC UA, MQTT, or REST API. They are differ differing in their properties as they are dealing with other requirements. On the field level, it's about real-time control of applications. The data from sensors needs to be collected, so we are talking more about bits and bytes. But this data needs to be available in the PLC within a few milliseconds. But as all the devices are connected to a central PLC, the data is not easily accessible from other systems. PLCs were not designed to provide the data to higher level systems. Each manufacturer of PLCs has their own protocol. And as a user, you are completely depending on the specific manufacturer in hardware and in software. On the IIoT level, there it's more about making data available between systems. So the diagnostic data of a site can per day easily reach some gigabytes. But here it's not that important that this data is available in the cloud within a few milliseconds. A couple of hundred milliseconds, when not even seconds or minutes, are completely okay here. But as it is about collecting data from different sites, this needs to be accessible across network boundaries. And when we want to collect data from different sites, there are different manufacturers. So we need to have a manufacturer independence. So much now for the comparison between the field level and the higher level IIoT. Let's now start with the comparison of the IIoT protocols. You may already have heard of protocols like MQTT, REST API, or OPC UA. We now want to do a quick technical comparison of them, but then look on the differences in a more detailed way when we build up a dashboard and show it on an example. We also have to admit that a comparison of these protocols is not completely possible. We already see this when we look on the standardization. So MQTT is just a communication protocol. There is no organization behind controlling how you as a manufacturer implement this into your devices. REST API is a programming interface. There are recommendations how to implement it, but also here there is no organization really controlling if you do it the right way. OPC UA at the end, it's a complete framework. There we also have organization, the OPC foundation, really doing standardization and certification. The second point, the footprint, is about the amount of data I have on my network when I use those protocols. MQTT is a very lightweight protocol. So we use a publish subscribe mechanism. The publisher provides data and all devices in the network can subscribe on it. So there is a stateless connection between a publisher and a subscriber. REST API, on the other hand, is based on HTTP or HTTPS. So here we have a client-server architecture. Um, with this, we have a stateful connection between a client and a server. This requires some data overhead, and thus the footprint of the protocol is a bit higher. OPC UA at the end, besides the standard process data, it also provides metadata. Thus, the footprint of this protocol is the biggest one. The last point, security, is always important to consider when I make data available in the cloud, especially when it's about sensitive production data. So for MQTT, security cannot be realized directly in the protocol. As I said, it uses a publish-subscribe mechanism. The publisher provides the data. Everybody who is in the same network can subscribe on this data. So as a user, I need to implement security on a higher level that I make sure I only have devices in my network which really should be there. So as I said, the REST API is based on a client-server architecture. By this, I can set a username and a password before data is exchanged. So I can realize partly security directly in the protocol. OPC UA even goes a step further. Additional to a username password, I can also set up a certificate management. By this, I am achieving a high level of security. But so much now for the technical comparison of the protocols. Let's now look on an example how to implement them. With this, we want to highlight the differences of the protocols. So we want to make data of a sensor available in an online dashboard. This is what IIoT is about. We are now starting with the steps for MQTT. 
For MQTT, you need to go to the homepage of the manufacturer, download the manual, and look for the supported topics. The topics are containing the data you want to get. Then, you are subscribing on those topics. For example, a topic could be process data input, containing the process data of the sensor. Now, if you subscribe on this topic, you receive a binary data stream. You, as a human, need to interpret this data and show the tool how to display it. For example, that the name should be displayed in text and the process data as a 1 or a 0, as it's the switching signal of a sensor. If you now want to implement a second sensor, you have the complete same effort as for the first sensor. You again need to download the manual, look for the uh, supported topics, and then subscribe on them. Again, you get a binary data stream, and as a human being, you need to interpret the data and what is behind there. Here we see that we want to get data from a rotary encoder, so we have a value from 0 to 360 in the unit degree of rotation. With this information, you can build up the visualization as you want it. Summary for MQDT. It's very easy to make single data of sensors available in a dashboard, but the effort increases per device you want to integrate. Let's now look on the steps for REST API. For REST API, you start with downloading an XML-based file. This XML file contains paths. These paths are the same as the topics for MQTT. If you are publishing a GET request on them, you get the data. So the same information as for MQTT, which is in the manual, for the REST API is in an XML file, which can be read by machines. So for the REST API, you connect to the respective device. Then you send a GET request on the paths you want to get data from. Here you also get a binary data stream, but additional information to this data. So for example, the data length. That the name of the sensor, for example, is two bytes, and the process data is a Boolean, so a switching signal. With this information, you can build up your dashboard. But on this level, we have to say, the effort between MQDT and REST API until now is completely the same. The first advantage of REST API comes then into place when you want to integrate a second device of the same manufacturer. The REST API can be standardized within a manufacturer so that all the different REST API devices use the same paths to access data. So for all Pebble and Fuchs sensors, if you want to get the sensor name, you will send a GET request on the path called name. So when you now integrate a second sensor of Pebble and Fuchs, your tool can have automatic rules to always search for this path and directly display it. So you partly automate your displaying or visualization of your dashboard. But as this device is a completely different device with different process data, here you again have to teach your tool how to display it. Now, the second advantage of REST API comes then into place when you want to integrate a second sensor of the same type from the same manufacturer. As I said, a manufacturer can standardize the REST API within his, his company. So, you now can generate rules that sensors from the same type should always use the same display of the process data. So, when you now integrate a second sensor, the, the tool can recognize that the second sensor is from the same type and directly build up your dashboard. But where are now the boundaries of the REST API? They come then into, pl then into place if you want to integrate sensors from different suppliers. As I said, behind the REST API, there is no organization doing standardization. So each manufacturer can implement the paths a different way. So the, name, the, the paths have different names to get data. So what the name for a Pebble and Fuchs sensor, for example, is, for a competitive sensor is called device name. If you now have rules in your tools searching for the path name, of course, for a second sensor, they will not get any data. In best case, you get an error message like we see here that the path cannot be found. So a summary for the REST API. For REST API, we can do partly automated uh, visualization of sensors in a dashboard. But the boundaries come then into place when you want to integrate sensors from different suppliers. 
let's now look how the steps look for OPC UA. For OPC UA, you connect to a server. And the server directly brings his complete information model. So it says to you which data it can provide. So the information which for REST API is coded in a separate XML file, for OPC UA is directly in the device itself. And additional to the process data itself, you get metadata. This metadata can say you, for example, that you are dealing with a value from 0 to 360, and it's in the unit uh, rotation uh, or degree of rotation. With this information, you can directly build up your dashboard. So you just have to connect to the OPC UA servers, and with the metadata, you know what the data is about. You don't have to look into any manual or separate files to interpret the data. But also here, we have to admit, the first step to do your first visualization is the same as for MQTT or REST API. The biggest advantages of the OPC UA interface come then into place if you are using standardized companion specifications. As I said, the OPC Foundation is doing standardization for OPC UA. And there are companion specs which describe for a specific sensor or sensor type how the information model has to look like. And this across manufacturers. So if you now integrate an encoder which is following a companion spec, you know that you get a specific information model. With this information, you can set rules in your tool that all sensors with this companion spec should use the same visualization. If you now integrate a rotary encoder from a competitor, but which is also supporting the same information model, your tool nonetheless can display, can display the data as all the data is standardized within the companion specification. So let's now summarize uh, the facts about the three protocols. For MQTT, we have seen that we can do an implementation of single sensor devices very easy and quick. We have a small fo footprint, but we have problems when we want to integrate sensors from different suppliers, and the manual effort increases per device you want to integrate. So MQTT is then used when you have your first ideas for IIoT and want to make first experiences. REST API goes a step further, and we have machine processable XML files. And we have a medium footprint. So we can easily integrate sensors from one supplier, but the boundaries come then into place when you want to integrate sensors from different suppliers. Then OPC UA, we here have a complete framework with metadata. But there is a standardization across manufacturers, and thus you can implement sensors from different suppliers very easily into your dashboard. But, of course, the data overhead is higher, and also the complexity of OPC UA is a bit higher than for MQTT or REST API. Thus, OPC UA is especially used when you really have an IIoT application and really know what you want to do with it. So much now for the technical part of this presentation. Let's now really show these examples on two live examples we have. Basis of both of these is our IOLink master, of the ICE2 or ICE3 series. This master combines a classic field bus protocol like Profinet or Ethernet IP with the IIoT protocols OPC UA, NQDT, and REST API within one device. And with the multi-link technology, you can send your data in real time to a PLC and always in parallel and simultaneously communicate this data to a higher level PLC via OPC UA, MQDT, or REST API. So this schematic what we see here, where a PLC is there to control the application in real time, in milliseconds, and where we have a parallel way into the cloud to make data available there, is our idea for the first example. So let's now have a closer look on this example. So we see here a sorting machine, which is sorting items based on the color. The red items should go to the lower position, the green one to the upper position. Part of this application is the IO Link Master of the ICE2, ICE3 series, here in the IP20 housing for cabinet mounting. All different components are connected to this IO Link Master. So we have a contrast sensor, which recognizes if an item is red or green. Then we have optical sensors, which are counting if an item is really processed the right way. 
And on the positions of the, where the boxes comes, there are RFID read heads, which read out the data if the box is posi positioned correctly. And then at the end, uh, I link stack light, which gives me a visual feedback about the process. So for example, when I position a green box accidentally on the red position, then it directly highlights that if I position it wrong, as it flashes red. So the IOLink master collects all this data from the different sensors and then communicates it via Profinet to a PLC. This PLC contains the logic if an item is needed or not. And then it co uh, controls accordingly the flaps. So if an item should go to the lower or to the upper position. Um, in parallel, the IOLink master is also communicating this data via OPCA to a cloud by the multi-link technology. So here we see data at the very left for identification, so which components are used, in the middle for the live process data and for the status, and on the right aggregated maintenance data. When I now take the boxes and position them for the sorting, the IOLink stack light flashes uh, yellow and shows me that it's in progress. And you see that the flaps are controlled accordingly if an item should go to the lower or to the upper position. So now the items are correctly filled, the application stopped. When I now position them back now to the, to the warehouse, we call it, then we see with some time delay that on the aggregated data, um, it's counted up. And this delay, delay directly shows why we need a parallel communication and hybrid systems. If you would have this delay in controlling the flaps, it would lead to missorting of the items. But that's why we have a PLC which controls the flaps really within milliseconds. So much now for our first example. Let's now have a detailed view on our second example. We again see the schematic of our first example, where we are talking about hybrid systems. We have a PLC controlling the application in real time, and we have a parallel communication path into the cloud. This is done because IIoT protocols so far are not real time capable. But there are actions to exactly achieve this goal. For example, TSN, time sensitive networking. If then IIoT protocols can co communicate within milliseconds, there is no need for a central PLC anymore. Then the data can directly be communicated into the cloud. We are using an edge gateway. This is showing the border between the physical lower level and the higher level cloud system. But the complete control logic would be within the cloud. This schematic what we see here is now the idea of our second example. Let's have a look on a short video. Let us show you a real-life example of how IIoT can improve businesses. The heart of every company is the coffee machine. When this machine is not running smoothly, it leads to production downtimes, critical situations, and worst case, to irreversible errors. Joking aside, SciMate, a manufacturing data expert, uses the Pepperell & Fuchs ICE3 module for a smart IIoT solution and has equipped their coffee machines with it. So this machine is the perfect example for the direct connection to IT systems without the need of a PLC. Every employee has an RFID tag with his or her personal data and preferences. An online dashboard shows the live data of the machine. This ensures that the need for any action is detected instantly, so that production does not stand still. Do you already see the benefits for your production line? Thanks to Pepperell and Fuchs hardware and SciMate software, this solution is easy to integrate and ensures that all processes run smoothly at all times. This is a great IIoT solution, not only for the automation industry, but also for small companies. So in this video, we have seen how we can make standard products IIoT ready.
This example is based on a partnership between Peppel and Fuchs and Simit. Simit is an expert for data-based process optimization. With hardware from Peppel and Fuchs and software from Simit, we could make a standard coffee machine IIoT ready and make it a cloud coffee machine. This shows how future applications can be controlled completely out of the cloud, but it also shows how IIoT can open up new business opportunities. Let's have a detailed look on this coffee machine and the used components. On the left side, we see the heart of this application, the IO Link master from the ICE2 or ICE3 series. To this master, we have connected different components, filling level, uh, filling level sensors for the coffee cup, as well as for the coffee bean containers and for the water container. Then we have a RFID read head, which reads out the data from an RFID tag containing the data about the specific user. At the end, also a IOLink stack light, which shows us the status of the coffee machine. It's blinking red when we, for example, have to refill water. All this data is then communicated via edge gateway to the cloud service of Simit, the Detect software. There we do data analysis, but as well data visualization. We see here the data of the filling level sensors. And the cloud service also provides additional information and provides instructions if, for example, the water needs to be refilled. Then this cloud service also controls the stack light on the lower coffee machine. So we here see the bi-directional communication between the cloud and the master and then to the components. <clears throat> On the lower level of this dashboard, we see the coffees per user and also the coffees which has been produced per day. Of course, we here also can think of additional functionality, for example, about automatic ordering processes of coffee beans when they are empty. But also in this state, this coffee machine shows a good example of applications that are co completely IIoT controlled. At this step, we also have to think of this idea for industrial purposes. So we can retrofit machinery. Machinery, which previously has no connection to the IIoT, can now be equipped with hardware from PNF, and we then can make the data available to higher level systems. So much for the second example. Let's now come to a final summary. We have seen that the world of automation is changing and developing towards IIoT. There is a difference between the field bus level and the IIoT level. While the field bus level with protocols like Profinet or Ethernet IP is focused on making data available within a PLC within milliseconds, the IIoT level is there to make data available across network boundaries. Also within the different IIoT protocols like MQTT, REST API, and OPC UA, there is a difference, but all of them are used for specific use cases. At the end, we saw that already with existing hardware from Peppel and Fuchs, we can realize IIoT solutions. We saw the possibilities and advantages IIoT is providing. So explore the advantages yourself and start with IIoT today. We from Peppel and Fuchs would be pleased to support you with this. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's now hand over to Oliver and the panel discussion. Thanks, Lucas. And as he said, we now want to go more into detail and show advantages and possibilities of the IIoT. And therefore, welcome to our panel discussion. As I said before, in order to minimize contact due to the corona pandemic in Germany and all over the world, we decided to meet here in a digital room. And with me are these experts, Sonja Ambruster, Benedikt Rauscher, Jörg Nagel, David Haferkorn and Michael Bresig. Welcome. And I would say, just give us a brief introduction of yourself. We start with Sonja. Thanks, Oliver. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sonja Amposter and I'm Product Manager for Industrial Communication at Pepper and Fuchs. We are a development crew which is responsible for all communication processes within the Pepper and Fuchs products like sensors or gateways, for example. Thanks, Sonja. Benedikt, please. Yeah, my name is Benedikt Rauscher at Pamela Fuchs. I'm working on global IoT and Industry 4.0 projects. That's a cross-sectional function. And hatefully, it could be said that there is no business unit I'm really belonging to. But the opposite is right. I'm working all over the company. 
And we'll proceed with Jörg. Welcome also from my side. I'm Jörg Nagel. I'm Managing Director of Neoception. And uh, what we are offering is uh, Industry 4.0 and IOT solutions within the Pebble and Fuchs groups to optimize our customers' business processes. And David? Yeah, also a warm welcome from my side. I'm David Haferkorn from Trade School from the Simon GmbH. Um, we are a company who develop an AI platform for process optimization uh, with AI, and I'm responsible for the product management and the quality department between our developers and our customers. And as I said, David, uh, Michael Brisek, is it Michael or Michael? That was is fine, but let's call me Michael. It's easier getting used to it. <laughs> so hello um, from my end. Greetings from Düsseldorf. I'm Michael Brisek. Um, yeah, managing director of Eyelash Consulting. We are a SAP logistics uh, company, supporting our clients in optimization of the logistics processes. And I'm um, yeah, happy to be here today. Thank you. And I would say, let's get it on. And we start with a quick clip. And um, it is about the interpretation of Pebble and Fuchs of the IIoT. No matter in which industry, sensors are the senses of every system. They are the eyes and ears, which capture the necessary data. Industry 4.0 needs Sensoric 4.0. And to actually benefit from this data, you also need connectivity and communication. With the ICE2 or 3 module, it is possible to seamlessly transfer data from the field level to IT systems or clouds. Smart products equipped with smart sensors bring smart data for smart processes. That's Sensoric 4.0. Sensoric 4.0. Uh, Benedict, tell us more about that. Yeah, Pebble and Fuchs is convinced that Industry 4.0 needs suitable sensors and therefore holds the brand Sensoric 4.0. With that logo, we sign all products that meet the specifications for Industry 4.0 and which are set up and actually uh, actualized yearly by platform Industry 4.0. For us, that means worldwide unique identification of the products and bidirectional communication based on agreed standards. Benedict, I totally agree with all your statements regarding the Sensoric 4.0. Um, you said one important keyword, um, protocols or standards. And uh, maybe to go a bit more detail into this topic, um, what are the main standards or protocol uh, would we use to make uh, sensory 4.0 uh, workable. So um, when we have a look at the field level, so the sensor and actuation level, um, we talk about IO link. And then uh, when we go one step higher, so the PLC level, uh, we have a communication um, on an industrial net protocol, Brophy Net or EtherCAT, or EtherCAT. And um, then also IoT protocols, for example, like CUA or MQTT or maybe a REST API, um, where we have the opportunity to go from a gateway towards, for example, a cloud application. Mm -hmm. uh, many topics you already mentioned, uh, so maybe we, we get it sorted a little bit. Um, let's start with brownfield applications. Um, Jörg, um, can you tell us how I IoT can be used there? Yeah, we, we just talked about IO-Link. Um, so the first thing to make uh, data available in IIoT applications is um, to have a, a good source of data. And IO-Link is there the, the standard of choice. Because if you have a, um, a machine which is uh, already existing, um, you normally don't want to replace the whole cabling inside this machine. So IO-Link gives you this kind of backward compatibility 
um, to just replace the sensors and the I.O. link masters, um, which have been former uh, I.O. boxes, um, and then directly start through into the IIoT uh, world. Um, you then directly will be able to access the data of the of the sensors, um, and with all this additional information which is available in these in these sensors. If you cannot change the cabling, this of course can also happen. Um, then you always have the possibility to easily attach new sensors to the machine, and even with a few sensors, you are directly able to um, calculate performance of your machines. Uh, for example, um, if we're talking about overall equipment eff effectiveness, um, that's something you can normally do with one or two single uh, sensors, and then you're upgraded your existing machine into the IIoT and the Industry 4.0 world with uh, a very, very little effort. Even there, I guess we have more than, than just one um, communication channel, because first the data needs to be sent to the controller, like the SPS machine, but additionally, we're going to send the data into IT systems. So just for example, to storage the data there for a tracking purpose, um, or even you can use this data to start follow-up processes. So it's really a nice place there. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when thinking of sensors, for me, um, speed, uh, communication speed, and time are uh, some some parameters I'm, I'm I'm thinking about. Um, is that correct? Is this that important? De depends on. Um, basically, we have to differentiate between line process controlling and. Uh, cross-process chain consideration. So, uh, in fact, is uh, that that inline controlling is more device and uh, machine related. And from our point of view, we are looking cross-process uh, cross chain uh, interaction, uh, see that cross-process chain interactions are mostly more, more sluggish, means um, you need more attention on the other field. That means uh, you need more quality of value, you need more informative, uh, your more information means uh, you need mostly more quantity value, then the synchronization uh, between different kinds of data sources is more important, and at least also the question is uh, how fast uh, you can realize complex analysis, uh, analysis means how can you manage big data, how uh, how good is your clustering uh, or performance on your on your platform? That's maybe one one insight of, of from our point of view. So time is not the the most important uh, uh, identifier for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, sounds like a complex communication. So for, for me, um, sensor was like measuring a data and telling the the result um, somewhere. So um, he, here we're now talking about bidirectional uh, communication. Uh, Sonia, why is this important? Yeah, Oliver, you're totally right. Um, when we look in the past, um, it was only possible to get like a measurement value or a set point or something from a sensor. But today, uh, when we talk about IOLink, yeah, we have a bidirectional communication interface. And um, this is really important because it gives the user um, the possibility to parameterize the sensor or to get um, identification data out of the sensor or even do diagnosis um, with the sensor. And um, without having this channel from an IOLink master to an IOLink sensor, this communication way wouldn't work. So that is the reason why this bidirectional communication interface is so important for all the IoT um, applications. Mm -hmm. And this is not only just a theory, we want to see how it works practically. And we have uh, a short clip with three, three <laughs> examples how it works in the field. Six o'clock in the morning, time for waste collection. All bins are equipped with an RFID tag. That's how the respective customer can be identified. The waste truck is equipped with an RFID reader, a tablet for visualization, an ICE2 module for connectivity, and an LTE gateway. How does that work? As soon as the truck approaches the bin, the RFID tag is read, and the data is sent to the company server via the LTE gateway for an automatic checkup of the customer status. If all bills are paid, this is visualized on the tablet within the truck cabin. 
If the bills are not paid yet, the driver receives the information on the tablet and leaves the bin behind. Industrial sensor technology and suitable connectivity to an IT infrastructure is the basis for this application. Industrial sensor technology is also useful for industries that are not directly related to the industrial sector. For example, port wine or whiskey warehouses. They store extremely valuable goods with long storage and aging times. In this sector, every drop costs real money. Even with a simple sensor system, including a control panel, problems can be detected quickly. If a barrel leaks, a capacitive sensor can help to recognize leaking barrels. The operator receives a signal and can intervene immediately. However, IoT solutions can bring even more advantages and can also be implemented as a retrofit solution. Data provided by a large number of sensors can be used locally and in parallel transmitted to powerful IT systems for further processing. For example, by AI-based algorithms. You have everything under control for constant quality, and more information about the warehouse is extracted out of the sensor data and generates added value. Let's have a look at how the OT and IT world can be connected. This is the end of a production line in an automotive manufacturing facility. The cars get finely checked before they leave the factory. The first car is arriving and can directly move into the testing area. Industrial sensors are used for efficiency monitoring of the test procedure. They detect the presence of a car and forward the processing time of each test station. Connected to ICE2 modules, this data is directly sent to an IT system. Testing is completed. Now it's time for the next one. The data is now available in an IT system and can easily be used for overall efficiency monitoring of one or several production lines. For realizing these kinds of applications, there's no need for a PLC as the ICE2 module establishes a direct connection between the OT and IT world. Additionally, the information can be displayed on a dashboard located in each production line for guiding the workers. So Benedict, when thinking uh, about IIoT, well, of course, industrial internet of things, we're thinking of an industrial environment. As we, as we now saw, it doesn't have to be industrial. What are the use cases? Yes, um, as we've seen in the video, applications are possible not only in classical industrial areas, as well in smart cities or also in agricultural environments um, like wineries or distilleries, IIoT makes sense. Um, everywhere where data has to be provided at the right time to the right place, that the user can use data easily and has real benefit out of that data, then IIoT is the choice. Yeah, and if we are talking about these um, uh, non-industrial applications. Um, if you if you're going into a rollout um, like smart cities with uh, thousands of devices, um, their IoT makes life much easier. Um, imagine if a operator uh, needs to uh, take care of the whole platform behind it, uh, operate each single computer which is behind it. Um, this is something which is easily leveraged by, by IoT and, and cloud solutions. Um, you, you, the user wants to have the technical insight. He, he wants to collect the data for a special need. And um, he wants to do data analysis and, of course, um, control his um, control his uh, business processes with this. And um, by providing the IIoT um, technologies um, and everything which is behind it, uh, the customer always has reduced investment costs. It's, it's easy to set up and uh, therefore he gets an, a fast ROI. Mm. And uh, thinking about all those scenarios, um, IOLink is playing the crucial role, right? Yes, that's right, Oliver. Um... IOLink is the main player in the game. Without IOLink, um, we weren't able to um, take the data out of the sensor 
to all the all the way up to the IoT applications. So even that, that's not only a single destination. So we're going to use that data locally, means for example in the shop floor, and additionally in, in some kind of IT structures. Yeah, maybe one other point of view, also uh, more. Uh, in, in, in concentrated on the or in conservation of the production process. Uh, in our customer cases, uh, one thing is obvious, I, I think. Uh, while process data is usually uh, available really often or too often, we uh, usually lack feedback data from the process. Means um, for, for sensor data, what does it mean? Uh, sensor data deliver a specific insight into the process or the additional insights into the process, specific additional insights. And then additional sensor data can realize the AI-based automatic analysis faster and more efficient. Like you have more feedback data, maybe not the highest quality as uh, a full quality measurement of a part, but with sensor data and some local measurements, you can realize a better um, uh, solution for AI-based uh, 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 analyzers uh, on the shop floor. And also, is it possible to realize some semi-autonomous uh, processes? Means um, an example is in a, a data-driven molding process, who takes the result of the injection molding uh, process um, into account. Is uh, some uh, example we also try to uh, realize with uh, the team of uh, Lucas and uh, uh, the IO Link Master uh, around. Uh, of our uh, devices we are uh, which we connected and uh, our customer yes and, and lucas uh, said in his presentation uh, or showed us that um, io link master is supporting the, the different communication protocols like mqtt uh, maybe you can tell us uh, something more about the benefits here yeah the nice thing about this is that um if you have a look at the needed hardware, um, a customer only needs a sensor and the IO Link Master, and that's all um, to set up the way to the um, IoT application because the um, protocols like MQTT are already inside the um, IO Link Masters. And um, the only thing maybe where the user have to care about is um, the uh, um, working firewall. But um, all the other stuff is set up and um, ready to use. So um, yeah, it's it's really easy and fast. And then yeah, you have to decide, or as a customer, you have to decide what you want to do with the data and where you want to go with the data through. And if you look into IoT um, applications and Industry 4.0 applications, they have a slight uh, difference between both, and um, there are protocols which uh, fit the needs of one and the other uh, best. So for example, um, our products uh, support OPC UA, which provides a common communication standard uh, for industry 4.0 communication. So every application you have within your facility, within your um, protected premises is their OPC UA communication is uh, the way to, to go, um, the protocol to choose. Um, our products support this seamlessly, and you can bring in every sensor you connect to an IO Link Master of, of Pebble and Fuchs to your IT world this way. And um, if you're talking about IoT solutions, um, which normally have some cloud components, then you can easily select MQTT, which provides a smaller uh, footprint. Um, uh, you, you can freely choose the data payloads, and uh, this way you can uh, have easy integration and, and efficient integration into um, cloud uh, applications. Mm -hmm. and, and thinking about um, use cases and um, implementation, uh, Michael, maybe, well, I, I guess some of you now would say, okay, um, what about my enterprise software? So how can they benefit um, from IoT connected sensors? Yeah, really a lot. So there are, as we already saw, there are a lot of benefits and also a lot of opportunities for, for several kinds of applications. So of course, for me, as I'm SAP uh, logistics consultant, I mainly focus on the SAP processes, where you can do really a lot with, with that new technologies. But I'm also thinking about other applications like Aveva tools, um, Amazon Web Services, for example, um, also the Predix, or also the, uh, the PTC Thingworks, just to name a few of them. Mm -hmm. 
talking of PTC uh, thing works, um, anything to add? Mm, maybe not only to PTC thing works, but maybe on a position as a developer of a IoT platform mm, as well. So we are spe specialized in uh, optimization of uh, production processes. It's maybe a, a different or it's really specific, but um, in, in, in in, in connection to our enterprise uh, uh, level, we see the, the following uh, added value. So, in the end, improved planning base uh, is one one uh, important topic. Means um, you can uh, improve the production planning, the quality procedure is better planable um, of the production process uh, as well. You can improve um, the product development. Uh, based on the better traceability over the production process of the good um, means you can have a look into into a post production from an older part but it's some similar uh, and you can have a look as a developer into the good and the production procedure some problems in the production procedure or something as well and in the end also um, in, in collect in, in, in connection to the ERP level or the enterprise level, um, is it better uh, you have better position, uh, for example, when you have some complaints uh, from your customer, you can react faster, you can combine the meta uh, data better with some pro procedures uh, in the production and see what's happened maybe in the production. You can see what's going wrong maybe or is, some, is nothing going wrong. Maybe the problem is more on the side at the, at the customer. So and in the end, uh, it's really important to connect the, the, the enterprise level uh, uh, with, with the shop floor level is really uh, important um, and a really good point for uh, or benefit for the, for, for, for the customers. Uh, that's uh, what we see as a as a specialist for our production processes. Thanks so far. These are uh, many aspects we already uh, covered, but I want to get some more input clip-wise. And this is about um, how data in the, uh, from the field can be used in IT systems. You want to bring transparency to your shop floor and automate your business processes? Neoception Stream, in combination with RFID read heads from Pepperl and Fuchs, can trace seamlessly all parts of the production. The worker gets direct guidance and can directly fulfill his task. As soon as the production job is finished, it is taken to the next station where it is automatically recognized. All boxes are ready for pickup. That information will be integrated seamlessly into the ERP system. And at the same time, the next unit gets a ping and can collect the finished components. This is real-time transparency. Current logistic status, HU availability, logistic stats, analysis overview, all clearly visible in our stream software. And Jörg, this is uh, something you can tell us about. Sure. Um, what you just saw is uh, a first product of Neoception, which is uh, called Stream, where we um, aggregate all the identification data which is uh, available in a production. Um, for example, from barcode readers, from RFID retests, um, all over your production. Um, and what we do is we aggregate it in, in one single place. We uh, enrich it with additional data so that it's not anonymous uh, data. You uh, always have a relation to the read event, where they happen to which time. And uh, the, I think the most important thing is um, they are somehow uh, pre-processed so that you have clean um, events where you directly can um, optimize the, the business processes on top. And that's exactly where we um, uh, interface to our partners like, like uh, Eilers Consulting, uh, where we um, use this data, we provide this data in a way that they can directly integrate it very easily into an SAP system and uh, where they can um, then directly influence the business processes and uh, also do decisions based on this data, which is normally not possible if we're talking about raw sensor data. 
um, yeah, that's what we enable here, and um, we're looking forward to your to your requests on this. <laughs> this, this sounds uh, something like, well, it's easy to implement everywhere, every time, uh, but I, I think it, there can be some uh, challenges. Maybe we have a, look, a little look at that. Yeah, okay, you're right. So, so there are really some challenges because if it would be easy, everybody would do that. Um, but so from my point of view as a logistics expert, mainly in SAP, so we have to optimize the processes of our customers and based on the sensor data or even also of the alpha d war data, we have to de detect what is the process we are going to optimize, which process should, should start after a different kind of event. And even for this, we have to enrich the data. So for example, we have to filter them first, what data is really needed for us, um, and also add some, some other kind of data, for example, location information because only with the enrichment of the data, we are able to, to integrate it uh, yeah, clearly into SAP and directly check there what kind of process could be directly start automatically. So for example, um, after an RFID event, we could, for example, say um, the confirmation of a process order can be done automatically. And even this is where neoception is, uh, is importing us a lot. So with this enrichment of the data, because without those cases, the enrichment by neoception and the process optimization by IDOS consulting, it wouldn't uh, work. And that's quite a big challenge uh, we just solved together. Maybe to bring it down a little to a, to a sort of a summary, what is the key aspect for a successful integration? So for, for us, it's uh, basically five points. Um, we need to have an attractive ROI, so it needs to be straightforward to implement uh, for, for a customer. Uh, the best way to achieve that is uh, through a plug and play uh, setup, uh, which is managed by some professionals who are uh, taking care that it's secure and uh, operational all the time. And um, one of the most important points for us is that the workers and the users are uh, asked um, and that it's a user-centric solution because if the users are not willing to interface or interact with this with the system, if they are they don't if it's yeah not easy to use, then um, they are not willing to, and then the investment is not uh, something which which works out in the in the future. So that's why we are very user-centric. And um, there's also one one point which is always if you're talking about um, solution. Um, we always need to adapt it a bit or we need to be ready to adapt it because um, you can develop an 80% solution for all the customers, but the rest of the 20%, that's where we are uh, able to ad uh, adapt it, uh, extend it to the needs of, of the customers uh, by our professional services uh, business also in, in Neoception. So we are open to, to your requests and uh, um, learn from, from your uh, requirements and then we can we can put that into into practice and make a, a successful solution uh, for you out of it. And I can imagine that there will be some uh, requests after that round. Well, um, before I finish this, uh, maybe you have um, something to add, something we didn't cover yet? Maybe I can make one additional statement uh, for the what is a success, a successful integration or a successful project and how is the implement, implementation of some IoT solutions or AI solutions uh, 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 successful. And uh, in general, I can, uh, I can tell uh, or I can tell you from our customer cases that um, we uh, Mostly, it must have a look uh, against the ROI in the, in, the, in the topic. So we have some stakeholders, we have some use cases, and uh, some user stories. Stories, and they are going from the operator at the machine to the quality department to the process engineering to the managing director. Every stakeholder has some different kind of interests, and uh, what I can tell you about is that uh, we are. With the focus of the production process, we are talking about the hard, intermediate, and the, and the soft facts, and also 
Um, we make some difference between uh, thermal shooting, the broad control, some ram ramp up procedures, and also the, the quality assurance. And in fact, um, we can talk about a lot, but in fact, you can say um, the OEE is very important, as, as Jörg told something uh, about it, and also is one topic to bring the, the user and the preventive ability to act, improve the the reproduction uh, stability and also one point is the simplif simplification of some process flow and in the, in the end uh, knowledge management is a really big topic. You have older employees, you have young employees, you have good employees, you have not so good employees and to to bring the the knowledge on the quality or uh, on the quantity base uh, a crown is the is the, is the most important uh, what we see at our customers before we talking about AI and some automatic production and so on. That's maybe some general insight we have uh, or we see at our uh, customers in the production. And as we see, we have the perfect experts here in this round and of course in the whole Pebble and Fuchs uh, family. Thanks a lot for this panel discussion. And if there are any further questions, no problem at all. Just use our contact form and we'll pass those questions on. So thanks for today. Thank you all. And um, I would say goodbye. Maybe you want to join us tomorrow. Then we're looking at the digitization in service and maintenance. So have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you.